Well, welcome to an afternoon to uh, honor and celebrate uh, Beverly Warren and Ed Ayers. Um, and uh, indeed, we actually are. Uh, as we close out our uh, 50 years celebration, um, thank you all for attending. I know it's been a for some of you, a long day, but I, I can tell that you have enjoyed it. Everyone I've talked with has been very, very pleased with the events and uh, the conversations and the depth that has come with the conversations. So we have a special opportunity because uh, this gives us an opportunity to bring back home um, Dr. Beverly Warren, who yeah. was one of our associate deans, then became a dean, and then she became our provost. Um, and uh, I get to take credit for the provost part. And then uh, she abandoned us to go to <laughs> Kent State University. And uh, she has been uh, phenomenally successful there. Um, I was part of the Mid-American Conference and um, had uh, a lot of knowledge of Kent State University and some of its issues and challenges. And let me just say, from everyone I know, that uh, everyone has told me that uh, Bev has made an immeasurable difference. Um, Thank you. So Bev, welcome home. It's great to have you back. Thank you. In great to be back. Virginia, and uh, we're delighted that you've done so well, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. I'm also really pleased to uh, bring back to campus one of my dear friends, Ed Ayers. Um, Ed Ayers, of course, has a wonderfully long history. Um, he is a tremendous scholar, um, historian. Um, you'll find out a little bit more about uh, that, but you'll also have an opportunity um, to, to learn from him. He is one of the most thoughtful people I have ever known. Um, he takes perspectives that, um, per offers perspectives that are very, very helpful to um, my thinking, and I hope you'll find, I know you'll find the same. Um, Ed was our Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia, um, and then he came here to the University of Richmond to serve as president for quite a long stretch, and now he serves as president emeritus, and he's a professor of history as well. So welcome to both of you. It's delightful to have you here, and uh, I look forward to a great conversation. So we elected to bring closure to this uh, day-long forum with some discussion because it's very important. Um, it's also really complex. Um, what we're talking about um, are some really difficult questions that need to be asked. They're challenging, but they're critical questions. And so I want to outline some of those questions so that Ed and Bev can give some thought to those. Um, one is, what and whose history do we choose to remember? How do we record and tell that history? What do we choose not to remember? Who gets to decide? And so here, I guess what I'm talking about is that historical events, of course, happen to every one of us as human beings, and we all have memories of those. But all of us haven't been given a chance to tell our story um, and to, tell, put, to use our voice in what we consider to be history. And what do the answers to all these questions say about us, and what do they mean about our shared future? There are no easy answers without question, but it's very important that we think about them together and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we've been asking these questions at Virginia Commonwealth University, as you've just seen, but it really isn't um, just a VCU question. Um, around the nation, people are thinking uh, quite broadly about how they're going to tell their history. Um, college campuses are, uh, have a lot of these conversations going on, cities, multiple organizations. Um, and let me give you some examples that might not surprise you. Confederate statues are a part of these conversations, historical monuments, uh, anniversary celebrations that continue to come up, and how we view them going forward is a really critical part of this conversation. On <clears throat> our history uh, that we choose to tell um, is the story of who we want to be and what we want to be remembered for. It's passing on what we value, it's a way to honor and celebrate what we choose to honor and celebrate, but it's also a chance to learn. It's a chance to heal and to think about ways that we can do better together in what we call the human experience. So I wanted to quote from Robert Penn Warren, the poet that most of you have heard of, and I'll quote directly, history cannot give us a program for the future, but it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and of our common humanity. 
so that we can better face the future, end quote. So a conversation about our history then is really what? A conversation about our humanity. So universities have become the epicenter of a lot of these conversations in the United States of America because universities have become central to American life. And without question, I say it all the time, I say it pretty much every day I speak, it's become central to the American dream. And quite literally, we know this from the beginning. From the very first General Assembly that was gathered here in Virginia, they passed an act to create a college in what we now know to be Henrico County. It was one of the first acts of this legislative body in the United States. By the way, this was 1619, barely a decade after landing at Jamestown. Would have been the very first college in what we call British America, but it never came to fruition. Others followed quickly. Colonial America had nine universities by the end of its first century, and of course that includes the College of William and Mary, of, of which VCU at one time was a part. The value of education and an educated population was very clear even at that time, and our understanding of that has just continued to rise with time. It's not surprising that universities are still the epicenter of American life, Important but often challenging questions and conversations occur at our, in our places. We've always been tasked with doing what's difficult and leading the way for the rest of society. And so now what we ask is, on behalf of American society, how do we choose to commemorate history? And how do we choose to remember history the his as we continue to evolve as a society? And so today we're joined with two of our experts, and they're going to help us think through some of these things. So I'm going to turn first to Dr. Warren, and then to Ed. So, Dr. Warren. Okay, well, thank you back. very, very much. Um, I can't begin to tell you what a pleasure <coughs> it is to really be back home at VCU and uh, share some time with you. I certainly spent 14 delightful years uh, as a part of this community. So it gives me great joy to return and uh, to return and uh, wish you well on your 50th anniversary as a university. And I uh, want to applaud you for this day of thinking about commemoration from a different perspective uh, beyond uh, balloons and uh, cake. What are the real issues we need to think about as we uh, celebrate milestones in our university's history. And so when I think about coming back and I see just the rich, amazing history uh, of this city, and certainly you can't uh, travel down Monument Avenue or uh, the streets of Jackson Ward without hearing and feeling those ghosts from the past and then moving into the present day. And what does it mean as we think about uh, commemorating and honoring uh, our past. And I think there's no better university uh, to really consider its legacy uh, of 50 years uh, in a historic city than Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, you have been certainly uh, noted for collective impact and community engagement. And as I think about where we travel today, um, community voices and, and allowing community voices to be heard and forging partnerships where there are true partnerships with those that we serve is, is so, <coughs> so vitally important. And so I wanted to start uh, a bit and we'll see if the clicker works. Um, maybe not. Do we need to point up? Maybe a point. Okay, there we go. Oops. Now it went. 10 steps too far. There we go. So this is my university, Kent State University. And so we might start thinking about, why would I begin with community engagement as the foundation for talking about uh, commemorations? And uh, as I said, uh, I think that that's exactly vitally where we should start when we're thinking about commemorating our history, is how do we engage the voices of those in the community whose voices need to be heard and sometimes aren't heard. And so I wanted to travel with you in terms of really thinking about how we commemorate and how we honor our uh, histories that are very different, but in some ways 
just so, so very similar. And so I wanted to start uh, with our discussion today uh, around Kent State University, and uh, we are spending a great deal of time thinking about a 50th commemoration at Kent State University, and that's the commemoration of the May 4th, 1970 shootings on our campus. And it is something that is uh, still an ongoing uh, discussion and, and opportunities to think about how you not only remember and honor, but how do you reflect and renew uh, when you have some challenging chapters uh, in your history. And so I thought it might be good to start with just a bit of a review uh, of where we find ourselves uh, in 2018. We're in the midst of planning for this 50th commemoration uh, that we hope will be a year-long uh, commemoration of the events of May 4th, 1970. But I thought you might know some of the headlines, but there might be some nuances that you may not be aware of. So I'll start just with a little bit of, of a background. So we commemorate uh, May 4th, 1970 uh, every year. And we commemorate it at our student commons uh, that is in the middle of our campus. And that student commons became the epicenter of uh, what happened on May 4th, 1970. And so as you recall, you know that uh, on May 4th, uh, 1970, the Ohio National Guard uh, moved into the Kent State University campus uh, and was trying to manage uh, a student protest uh, against the sudden American invasion of Cambodia. And that ignited uh, really passions across universities uh, in, in the entire country. Uh, and so on, on May 4th, our protest was not the largest protest in the, in the country. It wasn't even the largest protest in Ohio. Uh, but Governor James Rhodes sent the Ohio National Guard um, to manage uh, and create uh, what Governor Rhodes called law and order uh, on the Kent State campus. And uh, these National Guardsmen uh, fired live bullets into uh, a crowd of unarmed students uh, protesting that invasion of Cambodia. Four students were killed, uh, Allison Krauss, uh, Sandy Lee Scheuer, uh, Jeff Miller, Miller and uh, William Schroeder. Uh, nine students were injured on that day, including Dean Kaler, who was paralyzed from the waist down from that moment all on. No one was really able to make sense of, of that moment. Uh, 67 shots fired in 13 seconds totally changed lives, and it certainly changed the course of the history and the future of Kent State University. So in just 13 seconds, the course of history actually indeed changed. But I think some context of really observing the fact that there were many students on campus that day and around the commons that weren't really protesting. Many really were not subversive radicals. They were protesting. Certainly, uh, there were uh, shouts of anger. There were rocks thrown. But many students, including Sandy Scheuer and Bill Schroeder, were just walking to their next class. They weren't even involved in any form of protest. Dean Kaler was a freshman from a farm in Ohio, and he had never seen a protest in his life, so he wanted to just see what a protest might look like on his campus. And he was shot uh, more than 300 yards uh, from where the National Guard fired. So those are the stories that sometimes we don't see, that the students were really observing in many cases uh, rather than protesting. What you might also uh, be unaware of is that many of the National Guard uh, were also not in favor of our involvement in the Vietnam War. As a matter of fact, many of them joined the National Guard to avoid uh, enlisting or being drafted uh, into service 
for the war. And so there were mixed emotions even among guardsmen about why they were there and what their role was uh, in society at that time. What you also may not be aware of is, is just the, the fact that so many held so many strong emotions about that day. Uh, one Kent State freshman who was there at the protest took covers uh, during the rifle fire and then of course uh, Kent State was closed uh, for the rest of that quarter. Uh, she, and she went home uh, to uh, be with her family and as she walked in the door her father said they should have shot them all. And she said, do you realize that one of those then would have been me? And so there are really, really strongly held emotions uh, that divided families as well as you can tell. And many of you remember how divided our country was at that point in time. So as we move forward, we can see that we continued to try to make sense of the tragedy of May 4th. But in 1975, then President Glenn Olds announced that five years was enough to commemorate this tragedy. Uh, Kent State was really struggling to find its way uh, around this tragedy. Certainly enrollment was declining, uh, finances were very difficult, and so uh, Kent State tried to forget May 4th, 1970. But truly no one forgot including a group that uh, now and continues to call themselves the May 4th Task Force, took over the role of commemorating uh, May, May 4th, 1970, every year from that point forward to this current day. Many of you may not realize that the university is not in charge of the commemoration, that a task force made up of students, uh, some townspeople, some activists, uh, have continued the commemoration and when I came, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, uh, the administration uh, kept sort of a hands off uh, from the commemorative events. This is a candlelight vigil that is held every year uh, in honor of the commemoration and it's held on May 3rd, uh, the night before the, the May 4th shootings. And once again, even in that time, uh, a period in uh, 1975, uh, the Board of Trustees approved building an annex to our athletics complex on the site where the shootings had occurred. And so students protested, townspeople protested, activists protested, and they formed what was called a tent city uh, in 1977. And uh, more than 200 protesters camped out uh, on the grounds where the proposed uh, annex was to be constructed uh, for more than 60 days, and they only left when 193 of them were arrested uh, for trespassing on state property, and the annex was eventually built on the site, and that still troubles the May 4th families and many of the activists in, in the community as well, that the university did not protect and hold the ground sacred uh, where the shootings occurred. And so when you think about memorialization, it's, it's difficult. When we look at what we are trying to do here uh, and uh, at Kent State, uh, remembering the past is hard. Memorializing the past is very, very difficult and challenging. And particularly when there are multiple voices uh, that differ and differ strongly about how to memorialize. This is the May 4th memorial that began to turn the corner for us, but even with the May 4th memorial of 1990, uh, it was uh, economized uh, to about a tenth of what was originally uh, talked about as the funding uh, for the memorial. And so some to this day um, have disdain for this memorial because it is only one tenth of what had been imagined as a rightful memorial for the lost students, the nine wounded, and the tragedy uh, that occurred on our campus. And so memorials are hard. Uh, this is a view of Taylor Hall and another view of the memorial. And what we have been working toward over recent years is thinking about how memorials do not have to be static instruments of the past, but how can they inform us uh, moving forward uh, to our best future possible. And so 
I really wanted to share perhaps three ideas uh, around our learning at Kent State over time. Uh, the first is how important it is that all voices can be heard, how important it is to continually talking about what it means to hit a commemoration. We really don't call it an anniversary. Uh, we call it a commemoration, and annually uh, we have uh, different fora to really discuss what does it mean, uh, what did it mean in 1970, and what does it mean to us today. Uh, the families are still very troubled uh, about uh, whether their voice has been heard enough. Uh, the activists certainly feel that Kent State University did not step forward and take responsibility as we should. And so what I've learned in my four and a half years there is um, my first uh, May 4th memorial uh, period, uh, I invited the families back to have a breakfast with me just individually so that I could hear from the families uh, what, they, what their thoughts were and what, what troubled them and how could we move forward uh, toward a better way of remembering the loved ones they lost and the wounded individuals uh, who continue to be uh, branded individually uh, by that moment in time. And I think that meant so much to those families. Uh, the May 4th task force, when I first arrived, I was told, this is hands off. Uh, they don't want you. They don't want to hear you. They want to be able to commemorate the way they have for 40 years without the university. And so I asked to be invited to the May 4th task force uh, meetings. And that turned out to be uh, really a, a special moment where we talked about how can we do the commemoration in a way that honors what the task force had been doing for some 45 years, and then what might we do that could elevate and lift the conversation if the university became a part of the discussions. Uh, so listening, and listening authentically, I think has been uh, a, a real plus uh, for the Kent State University community and, and those uh, who were forever changed on that day. Uh, the second lesson is that if I haven't learned anything in four and a half years from the May 4th families, it's that they have a strong commitment to education. They really want to see uh, not only a history uh, recounting of May 4th, 1970, but what are the lessons that we have learned and what is the history that we should remember lest we repeat some of the mistakes of our past. And so uh, what we have done uh, at Kent State is we have a first year experience class, uh, just like here at VCU. And uh, what we have done is to require uh, a segment on May 4th, 1970. So every student who comes through Kent State University understands the history, but also understands what are the lessons that we should be uh, speaking of as we move through um, our uh, future uh, as a university and future leaders of this country, what might we have learned that could have more peaceful resolution of conflict? The other element of education, uh, we now have a school of peace and conflict studies, uh, which we are using as an element of continual education uh, day in and day out, uh, not only from uh, individual and group mediation, but from the idea of conflicts that might occur nationally and internationally, so that we might be able to do what we call speaking through the wound of May 4th. We might have keen insights on how other communities can manage uh, conflicts uh, to avoid tragedy uh, that, that we experienced. And then lastly, I think a lesson learned is that Memorials need to look forward as much as they look backward, and that as much as we can set the context for really sharing what is our hope for the future, how might we work together to have more peaceful dialogue, to understand that we can differ, but we don't have to resort to violence, to understand that it's exceptionally important to listen to other voices to even strengthen your own voice? And how do we have that dialogue of vehemently opposing uh, points of view, 
but do it with respect and do it with uh, areas of wanting to listen and learn. And I think we've made great progress, uh, but certainly we know that as time goes on, there are still those lessons uh, to learn from the experience of May 4th, 1970. And so one of the things that we have done uh, is to dedicate our site. It is now a National Historic Landmark site, 22 acres in the center of our campus. And that is hoping, we're hoping is going to be a beacon of uh, light for education for others to come and learn more about what happened on our campus so that those lessons will promote a better future and a healthier future for us all. And then lastly, um, these daffodils are planted on the hill of the commons uh, to represent uh, the number of individuals that we lost uh, in the Vietnam War and that we uh, create memorials that go beyond our own thinking but expand to what is it that we have learned about war and peace and how might we make for a more peaceful future for us all. And I think that has been what has resonated for us uh, through time. And it is still a journey. And I think as we work on um, this opportunity to think about memorials, one of the things I think is very, very important is that uh, what I learned from Mike Rao is how do we become more inclusive in our dialogue? How do we make sure all voices are valued? How do we learn? from the mistakes of the past, and how do we use memorials to think as much forward as we do looking at the past. So those would be the insights I would share. Excellent. Thank you very much, Beth. <laughs> and Ed, may we turn to you now. I, that was awfully good and powerful, and I, I kind of resent it uh, for that reason. But <laughs> Now, I'm, I'm so glad to have a chance to, to join you. I'm such an admirer of VCU and grateful for what you've done to the city I've, I've come to love. Um, and um, it's great. Mike and I are working together over all these years, and Bev and I have worked together before as well. So I, my comments are like turning the telescope around the other side because the advantage I have is I was thinking about this a long time before anybody cared about it. Um, and for 40 years, uh, and you know, I published a book in 1992 in which I t talked about the lost cause and the monuments, and they're not what you think they are, and when they were put up, and what people said, and you know, nobody really cared uh, very much. I think people saw uh, the monuments on Monument Avenue and other Confederate monuments around, like old Victorian furniture that somebody left in the middle of our city. You know, they're just kind of well. It seemed like a good idea sometimes. They're kind of, they're impressive. But, uh, and they didn't speak to us, um, except they spoke to African-American people, I've learned uh, from who come up in all the conversations I've had about the, the Monument Avenue Commission. One woman came up, squeezed my hand. She says, you know, Dr. Ayers, when we were children, they would take us to these monuments and say, these are for us. This is for us to stay in our place and stay quiet. And so... I tell that to white people, and it's like, what? No, we don't mean that. We just love General Lee. And, he had, and so you know, I've had occasions to talk to really hundreds, maybe thousands of people about this around the country. Um, and we kind of had a, a running start on it uh, before Charleston, and then a place that I know and love also before it became an event, Charlottesville, um, and to think about where Richmond fits in all this. So... In many ways, we are dealing with all this in ways we did not before. I say it's very spasmodically. Uh, we're not really sure what we're talking about or why we should be talking about it or what we mean by it. Uh, and it's been interesting, though, to hear that people can change their minds about things. Uh, we found in the Monument Avenue Commission that people would line up at the microphone and you couldn't tell what they were going to say about what they looked like. You know, uh, by the race or gender or age. And they would go, well, what, what's this one going to be, you know? And it would turn out that some people who hated the monuments think they should stay right there as a reminder of what they should, of, of the story they should tell. Um, and other people who had come, who 
had grown up <coughs> loving the monuments said, I had no idea they were so hurtful. They should come down. So the lesson I took from all that is that people change their minds and people pay attention and listen to other voices uh, that they hear. Um, ultimately, I, mean, I don't know if people understand the sequence, but so when Mayor Stoney asked us to have the commission about uh, Monument Avenue, uh, he gave a fiery speech, uh, but then did not mention removal as one of the possibilities. Uh, and we had a, a big meeting at, at the then Virginia Historical Society and f overflowing crowd and people walked in holding up signs that said, no context, no compromise. And so the very idea of explaining where the statues came from and who put them up and why and what they said when they did and what other people said at the time was seen as a denigration of it. Okay? So that was on a, I believe, a Thursday. And then on Saturday, uh, we went to Charlottesville. I was going to teach a class in the afternoon as a kind of a counter. Uh, I was going to talk about voting rights. Uh, and our daughter and son-in-law were going to show a film about urban renewal in Charlottesville and also about lynching. And so we were watching the television, getting ready to drive downtown, and we never got the chance, of course, because of what happened. We got an email saying everything is off. And so to see a place that had basically lived oblivious to the Civil War for generations, even though it had these statues there, uh, I used to kid my friends that somehow I went directly from Thomas Jefferson to today. I believe some things happened in the meantime. But that was another lesson. Just because you're ignoring history doesn't mean it doesn't have enormous power. And just because you're not aware of it doesn't mean other people aren't. And just because you're at peace with this and have your own story about what that means and it seems okay, it doesn't mean that everybody feels that way. And matter of fact, it seems to me what the events of the last few years have shown us about the Civil War and slavery is the more that history is suppressed and ignored, the greater power it has to disrupt when, when, it, when it is shocked into action. I think that the um, other thing to think about is, you know, uh, because I've written about this some, you know, people uh, asked me to come in and talk with them about their universities. When the University of Mississippi had us come in, Christy Coleman and I from the American Civil War Museum. And that's interesting, just sort of dropping in and just line up one group after another, you know. Um, and they had nothing in common. We'd, we'd meet them for one hour, then the next people come in and say something entirely different. And then we'd report out and say, here's what they said. They said, no, we live here together. That can't be the truth. I said, we just heard it. And so that's the case. So people are living the same history simultaneously um, and that are reading the history of the past in different ways all the time. Now, partly it's because Americans aren't really good at thinking about history. We think we like history, but when we say that, we really mean nostalgia. We really mean history that makes us feel good about the awesome people that we are and the things, even when they did less awesome things, like you know, go to war against the United States, uh, we're inclined to look for the good things underneath. You know, what were they really fighting for? And weren't they, you know, we, it became clear that most meetings we would have about um, the Monument Avenue, that somebody would point out that Stonewall Jackson had taught his slaves at Sunday school. That was sort of a recurring motif. Um, and of course, everybody brought up that General Lee was really torn about joining the Confederacy and, and turning in his oath against the United States, um, but couldn't raise his hand against his own people, so that's okay. And so people have like these little stories that they use to kind of make sense of all these things and kind of explain them away. And I think what we've seen in the last few years is that these illusions that the past was painless and that it all worked out, and that everybody was brave and everybody was good, is not really the kind of history that we need. We're not doing ourselves any favor, and we're not doing our kids any favor to tell them fairy tales about how we got to the, where we are. And so as a result, I find two things. One, young people think that all the good people we're ever going to have have already been here and gone. We're never going to have another Martin Luther King, right? Nobody's ever... Well... People thought that before he arose, and that can happen. So ironically, if you tell this fairy tale, and I find that most of the students showing up and they write an essay, they feel like every essay about American history has to end with, 
And despite this painful episode, we then became the great people that we are today in a beacon. Well, you know, you don't have to say that every time. Let's just look it square in the face. So, you know, going to the University of Mississippi, you know, the rebels and the flags and Dixie and Confederate Drive and the monument right in the center of campus and the Mississippi State flag still has the stars and bars on it. All those things are uh, in your face. But then people asked us to come to Yale and talk with them, or who would have, would have seemed immune to all this, but then they had a college named after Calhoun, uh, John C. Calhoun, and from the 1930s, at what point that didn't seem problematic to anybody. So as you think about how universities are dealing with this, it's across the whole range of possibilities, and somehow, the scale of it doesn't necessarily correspond with the impact or the power that it has. So I think that, um, you know, something that VCU and UR share uh, is we've had a discontinuous history. You know, we've had a history where we, had, we, we began as one thing, or in your case, two things, uh, and then grew into these other kinds of history. You are, as you know, used to be on your campus, <laughs> and then moved out in 1915. There's no commemoration of anything Confederate or slavery-related at the University of Richmond, but we know it was born in the center of the largest slave state in the 1830s to train white boys to be Baptist preachers. And that my predecessor as president, there, the very first one, was appointed by the state of Virginia to be in charge of the first African Baptist church. And that was his job to represent the power of the state as people in the largest church in the Commonwealth, 3,000 people. And he was, he's, wrote later, he said, I was in an impossible position because I knew that the parishioners didn't want me there and they didn't need me there, but it was required. He, he did have a good line. He said, it was against the law for any of the, of the black congregants to preach. But he said, but we did have some very long prayers. Uh, and so but <laughs> trying to navigate this. Now, I'm thinking about this because I've, President Crutcher has asked me to co-chair with Laura Nett Lee. Uh, a commission such as this for ourselves, and we think back about it. And of course, you have the challenges of MCV and of the anatomical theater and of the, of the helping to support the largest hospital in the world at Chimborazo during all this. And so I think one thing we've learned is that it doesn't do any good to act like those things didn't happen. It doesn't do any good to act like, you know, that we are not in the former capital of the Confederacy, that we can't fool ourselves that anybody who hears the name of where we are or the name of the University of Richmond, kind of like Kent State, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of have that aura. We don't do ourselves, as maybe people tried to in earlier generations, just to, well, that's the past. That's over with. Why dwell on that? And one thing I've learned is that when I started, we, when I came here in 2007, and then that was coming up on the anniversary of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, and because I do this for a living, we, they asked if we would have the first <coughs> session in the nation on the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. And I said, well, only if we do one thing. It's not just the Civil War. It's also emancipation. It's the ending of the largest and most powerful system of slavery in the modern world. Civil War reads white. And the blue team and the gray team running around going long and, you know, that sort of thing. Emancipation, it's not really owned by anybody. Where's our national holiday to celebrate the most important things that ever happened in this country? The end of perpetual bondage that had been here for 250 years. So the whole country is complicit in all of that. And so I think that we've been living through a, a, a time of awakening. What we don't have is the language to talk about this that's not merely sitting in judgment of the dead people of the past, to whom, all of whom, I am morally superior, because I'm alive and they're not, they can't fight back, right? So what is to say, on the other hand, to downplay in any way the enormous suffering that took place right here beneath our feet in this city? I think 
I'm very proud of a lot of things that we've done here. I'm proud of the Monument Avenue's commission's reports and the way we did it, the open process. Uh, we listened to every voice you could listen to. I'm proud of the American Civil War Museum that's going to be opening up this spring that's going to tell the story of this conflict in a way it's not told anywhere else in the world. I'm proud of the new statue to emancipation that's going to appear on Brown's Island. It's going to be the first one in the country that is celebrating what it meant to have the shackles fall from your arms and to be able to hold a baby in one hand and an Emancipation Proclamation in another. I'm proud of the Maggie Walker statue. But we've been talking for too long about how to commemorate the fact that we were the center of the domestic slave trade, that we've sold 400,000 people out of this city, that in many ways this was the worst place to be enslaved in the country because any day you could wake up and find your children taken away from you. So Monument Avenue, we'll see what happens and all that. We, everybody agrees you've got to explain what these things mean, why they're there, what meetings they have had, what meetings they still have. But in many ways, the thing that we most need to commemorate, the thing that underlies the anatomical theater, the thing that underlies the Confederacy, the thing that underlies the problems of poverty and segregation that still plague our city, is still invisible to us. There's nowhere you can look and see slavery except in all its consequences, which are all too evident. We have the opportunity in the same way that you're embracing opportunity for it help us think about those hard years, the Vietnam War, you know, I was starting college the year after Kent State, and it brings back the sense of the divisions that went right to the very core of every family, mm -hmm. right? Things, who are we? What do you believe in? At the same time, I think, what would it mean to come up with, what an opportunity it is, an honor it would be, to be the only place in the United States that actually confronts the fact that a million Americans African Americans were sold from the eastern United States to the western in just a few decades. And that two million African American enslaved people were bought and sold within the South. How can we have had 150 years and not be able to see that for our students not to understand it? The thing that I, I'm, I'm giving a talk now ending the Civil War, which I keep thinking will mean that it, I, I will be ending talking about it, but i I keep not. Um, and one of the things that I pointed out is what's the problem that people are disagreeing about the Confederate monument so much? We have not been able to move the percentage of people who believe that the Civil War was about slavery in decades. 40% of Americans still believe the Civil War was about or caused by states' rights. Southern Poverty Law Center did a study and found that young people, 8% of people believe that it's the centrality of slavery. So our responsibility in Richmond, at VCU, University of Richmond, the whole city, is to be an entire city that's a site of memory, of commemoration. Now, when we first started talking about a lot of this, I found some people, oh, Ed, let's forget all that boring history stuff, you know? We've got great craft beer here, you know? <laughs> and let's just move on. And I think one thing that we've discovered is you cannot go around history. You can't just leave it behind. You have to go through it to get to anywhere you need to be. So I think that sometimes people go through it by choice. Some places, like Charlottesville, were dragged through it. I think Richmond, we have the opportunity now. I think there's so many people of goodwill and so many people who are determined that in our moment of history, that we rise to the occasion. Our moment in history right now is we are in a position to help all the generations that follow us remember what happened here generations before. So having the institutions of higher education take the lead in that. Mm -hmm. um, Mike hosted one of the very first things that we did on, um, on the future of Richmond's past. Right. Um, and John Kneebone, a great ally in helping move that forward, and Kathy Howard other people helping us make this happen. So we've shown that, it's kind of like the May 4th group, that a collaboration is the way to do it. We all need to help everybody else deal with the historic burdens. It's too heavy for any one institution or any one group to carry by themselves. And so I think that 
for this institution that is in many ways saved our city, um, to have the opportunity to help us become the place, and this is my dream, that when people think about who in America has stepped up and accepted the responsibility for thinking about the hardest things in our history, it could be Richmond, Virginia, and I think it should be. So that's where, where I'll start. <laughs> So as moderator, um, I'm positioned to try to ask you questions, um, but I have to tell you that um, almost any question I could ask you, you both really already answered. Um, you know, and a few things do linger, though, and I wanted to ask yeah. you this. Given the, the work that you're doing um, specifically or have done with the Monument Ave Commission, um, VCU, it turns out, on this campus, um, on our campuses, um, does have um, some symbols and um, commemoration, memorializations that we have to think through and deal with. Um, what advice do you have for us here in the context of the broader yeah. um, charge that you've kind of given us, which I accept, by the way. I do think we absolutely, as the colleges in town, need to figure out how, to, um, how we're going to um, cast Richmond in the light that you just described beautifully. I won't repeat it because you did such a beautiful job. Um, give us your advice because you learned so much from such long deliberations and what I'm most proud of with you, Ed, is that your, is your willingness to patiently listen to so many voices that have never been heard. Thanks, Mike. I'd say there was a journey on the Monument Avenue Commission, a lot of people that I know and respect. Uh, we got lots of calls all the time before this, even from international media, you know, and they'd say, wow, what's happening there? And boy, things are falling apart. And I said, you know, this is good that we're talking about this. This is not a malfunction of democracy that we're talking about these huge statues in the middle of our city. This is something that should happen. And I, I was at one thing and some guy said, yeah, all these people talking about the statues, just like the Taliban. I said, no, this is <laughs> democracy. <laughs> this is all public, public officials, people accountable in a time when everybody can hear what they had to say, unlike the time the statues were put up, you know, when there were no voices of people who might have disagreed, right? You know, in the 1920s, when the statues in Charlottesville were put up, 15% of eligible Virginia voters voted because... The, disfranchisement had just stripped the voter. So it, they were not put up in a public way. And now we have the chance to do that. So I, the first thing is that it's hard because you have to listen to it sometimes and people like hold you accountable even though you're just sitting there, you know. Uh, and, but I saw, I would say our general feeling is that of the, uh, if we divide the opinion on the Monument Avenue Commission into percentiles, about 20% of people thought the statues had to go about 20% thought they should never be touched, maybe, maybe actually burnished. But 60% of people said, you know, yes, we have to do something. Yes, we have to explain them at the very least. We have to add more. We have to think about different kinds of monuments. You know, your wonderful ICA is an opportunity to have like monuments all the time, memory. And monuments is a bad word because we think of bronze right. guys on horses. but. Um, an artifact of memory can be lots of different things. It can be some of that wonderful contemporary art that we have here. Um, but we also found that most historians don't think it's a good idea to tear down most history, you know, uh, and that it would be better to use it as a conductive material to connect people to what it stands for. The problem is that the statues had grown silent. They said only what the people put them up wanted to say, which is Lee. Must be important. Look how big this statue is, right? <laughs> I think if we can make those statues talk to us and say, there was a time when Americans fought a war over the future. A, would you save the United States, which we tend to forget that's what the war was over, and would perpetual bondage be brought to an end? If we can use the statues, including the ones that you have on your campus, 
as a way to see through the present into the past. And, you, and ironically, understanding where the statues came from is more helpful than just going back and having a plaque about who Robert E. Lee was, right? Oh, this came up 20 years after he died. Uh, he might have opposed it. Uh, the only city black council member <laughs> said this is a monument to treason at the time, right? Mm. It, it, so understand that history is in layers and that we're just another one. Sure. Uh, it actually makes the monuments say more to us. So on the other hand, as you know, the mon or some of you may not know, the Monument Avenue Commission recommended that when it is lawful to do so, that the city consider taking down the Jefferson Davis Memorial. And that's because it's the clearest embodiment of the lost cause ideology that swore this had nothing to do with slavery. And that it was, I mean, the, when you have the goddess of vindication, which is what's there on top of that column, uh, and all the words basically around it are declaring that this was a pure and noble cause. In the, this is the early 20th century. That's a different thing than a, another kind of monument, right? Yeah. So I think that I wish I could say that I had discovered in all these thousands of conversations um, a formula that would unlock what we're supposed to do. But Beverly said the, the thing is that these are occasions for continued conversation, not for us to, okay, well, that's taken care of. We don't ever have to think about that anymore. We should be thinking about it. And commemorations are useful. You know, I think one of the things we were able to seize the 150th anniversary of Civil War Emancipation is the way to get people's attention for it, right? Sure. Uh, so a commemor a, an anniversary is a monument. It, it's a moment when, when people would come together and pause for a moment to think about what this might be. So I think that um, the process and the outcome are the same thing, the, which is like, what do we think about this? Do we think something differently about it this year than we did five years ago? Hmm. If we do, that doesn't mean that they were fools. It means that the horizon has moved. We can see things that people couldn't see before. And the people coming after us will be able to see things we don't know. One, I think a key aspect of all this is humility. Not to come in and go, now, I'm wise. I've seen through all the lies that you've been telling each other. It's just because we're in this moment of time that we can see it. And we don't have to think very hard if somebody from 50 years from now would come back into the Richmond in which we live. And they would go, how did those people tolerate those wrongs, that injustice in their midst? What was wrong with those people? That would be a good question, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think the trick is for, to use the monuments as mirrors okay. rather than obstacles to seeing. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Bev, you've had the um, unique opportunity here of being at Kent State for five years, but also being a longtime member of the VCU community. And you're aware of some of the um, symbols that uh, exist around campus. You've been gone for a while, but you've had this experience at Kent State that has taught you so much. Um, as you look at this environment and that environment, um, what's your advice for us in consideration of that? And how do we be certain, how can we be certain that we are truly paying attention to the broadest possible range of voices in, um, in, in, th that are there that can offer us the, the perspectives and, and really the, um, the wisdom that we need in order to determine how to move forward? So, so that's a hard question to answer, Mike. Um, I think what, yeah, what I would... There are different places, I yeah, understand. I, well, I would, I, I would switch it a bit. I, I learned so much uh, being a part of Virginia Commonwealth University and being in Richmond sure. that when I went to Kent State, I, I was really taken aback. I, th I thought that the Kent State shootings were sort of unidimensional, you know, certainly that was a horrible thing, and certainly everybody felt that was a horrible thing, and didn't we all wrap our arms around um, the fact that these students were expressing their First Amendment rights, and 
what a tragedy that was. And what I came into was this huge complexity of differing points of view. And navigating that, I, th I think the similarities are we tend to think we're so polarized. You either uh, feel those monuments must come down and, and they have to, or those monuments must stay because they're just a part of who we are in the South and they're part of history. Yeah. And uh, there's so much in between those, and, and that's what I found at Kent State. Um, the city of Kent was very polarized against the university, and, and there's still some of those underlying tensions because keep in mind on the night of uh, May 3rd, there were fires in the uh, streets, uh, bar yeah. windows um, broken and uh, brawling students who were closed out of the bars. Uh, just think about decisions that we make. So we have students who are drinking and we think they're getting too rowdy, so let's just close all the bars and put them in the middle of the street. That sounds like a reasonable solution, right? <laughs> And uh, so, we, but the city of Kent, what, what I have found is if we come together and we acknowledge the moments of the past um, that have so many nuances in the story, sure. and you don't try to polarize people, you don't try to place them uh, into certain points of view. And I right. think that's what, what I found when I got there. I couldn't believe that Kent State University administration had nothing to do with the May 4th commemoration. This little band of students with an advisor, not more than 10 students, sure. um, commemorate this huge piece of our history every year. And so I started having the conversations, why, is there a way that we can come together and share our recollections but also share what is it that we hope for the future. And I think that's what I would see is if we can come together and what is it that we hope for our future, that has seemed to pull us together sure. uh, in ways that perhaps it hasn't happened in the past. So last question for both of you. Um, higher education has been a part of, an important part of the fabric of the United States of America from the beginning, I mentioned that in the introduction. Um, it has been, in many ways, to the minds of many, um, pretty resilient to any significant change in terms of what we're teaching and what we think is important to teach. Are we getting, are we changing, are we getting any better at recognizing the diverse perspectives that, candidly, more so than we as a faculty, um, our students can bring to the perspectives that we need to learn from ourselves as universities, as entire universities communities. And I mean the kinds of things we as a faculty need to learn from our students because they have grown up very differently than so many of the, uh, our colleagues who are professors. Are we getting better at this? Are we, do we see a future that gives us an opportunity to truly embrace their engagement in shaping the future of higher education and what we believe is important to be taught and to, to important to be discussed because we as a faculty control an awful lot in the classroom. How are we doing? What's your pro what, what, what are your feelings about the future? Wow. Well, I'll start and then uh, maybe it'll be a, a, a give and take here. I, I actually have really high hope for, for our future. What I see in the young people today is a very engaged, very caring, very passionate group of young people. And they're willing to speak up and speak out. Uh, now at Kent State, uh, because I think of, of being grounded in our history, our, our students uh, freely express themselves. Um, I, I laugh because you, you were a part of that. In my first year, <coughs> Uh, because we were going through so many things with um, uh, collective bargaining with the faculty, with wage and um, yeah. earnings of our classified staff, with uh, so many things swirling around. Um, that community uh, protested my first um, commencement in December. They protested my holiday uh, 
celebration, um, end of semester. They protested my inauguration. They protested the spring <laughs> commencement. Um, but I admire that because they feel passionately. They, they know that expressing their voice is important and they know that gaining the attention for their point of view is, is one way of doing that is to be a part of uh, the ceremonies that are going on at the time. So I see that as a positive, and I always have. And so you look at the Parkland students who are, are really pushing uh, us to think about uh, what do we do about guns in America? Well, that's another piece of history of how do you hang on to Second Amendment uh, rights um, at, at the expense of so many lives lost. And so, so I'm proud of this group for speaking up and speaking out. Um, so I have high optimism for the youth of today. Excellent. Thank you, Bev. Ed? Yeah, I tell you, that's, you're more patient than I am. I, I, <laughs> but, but that's the point. I think, Mike, you're exactly right. And, and uh, the other day somebody said, God. Kids these days, you know, they get their face on their phones. I said, you know, they're so much better than mm -hmm. I was when I was in college. Mm -hmm. That they're so engaged. I mean, matter of fact, yeah. administrators have to run as fast as we can to create the, the avenues, the opportunities that they demand. And so I think the, I am also very optimistic. I would say what's, what we have to remember is that every group has to kind of protest or make its own voice felt. And so you have to be patient as a minister. It's like, I know we, we talked about this last year and we work <laughs> on it, you know. It's like when I grade freshman papers, it's like, I told you not to use the power. Well, no, that was last year, you know. <laughs> and so, it, you know, our institutions are like rivers, you know, they, you know, they look like they're always the same and they, they're constantly changing. Yeah. So I That's believe that the generation coming up now is a great gift, and our, our job is to try to make the most of it. That's kind of what I think. I, I, th I think one thing that, that does concern me is that we still seem to be talking with like-minded people. So I protest with my group, and we all believe the same thing, right. so, so that's what we believe. But there's no crosstalk. There's no really seemingly willingness to say, well, tell me what your perspective is and how might I better understand, how might it better inform my voice. Sure. And the conversations aren't there as much as I would like. Sure. They're more polarized with their own beliefs uh, in their own tribes. Sure. And that is why we have classrooms, because that's the most sacred place in America, is a place that people can come in and listen to each other, we stimulate the conversation. Sure. And you know, when it's out sort of free range opinion, you're right, they can't possibly do it. But when people are sitting there, it's our best chance. We're gonna to talk to them longer than any news clip or whatever. Hey, let's just think about this. And so, you know, you're right that many people see us as resilient uh, in the wrong ways, but we are supposed to be the place where people come and are outraged and demonstrate and protest and are dissatisfied. But we're also the place, we're the only place really, that people can come together, people who unlock themselves and get a chance to hear somebody else's opinion. So I think, you know, everything that points to the growing importance of higher education in all its manifestations. So. Uh, Bev, Ed, thank you so much. Thank this you. has been a wonderful conversation, a wonderful opportunity to be together again with both of you. Excellent advice for us as an institution, but also excellent advice for us as a faculty, because we do have to think very differently about how rapidly people are changing. And as you're, you're absolutely right. I love your analogy of the, the river, Ed. Um, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, the reality is that, um, it, it, well, and I guess this, I, I'll, I'll close with my opinion. And my opinion is that I feel brighter, I feel more optimism for the future than I ever have. I have to tell you, when I first got involved in higher education, I wasn't so sure of what my life would be like or how resilient higher education would be. And candidly, not really reflecting a whole lot of what I ever thought, um, I would certainly try to do my best to learn from what everyone who had taught me 
um, would want me to say going forward, and I assimilated quite well. <laughs> but I feel a, le a level of optimism and hope and excitement from the creativity that I see in our students now that gives me so much excitement. And they, so, they are so articulate and so excited about the future and very proud of who they are, and they're not ashamed at all to talk about who they are and where they've come from and what they want to see become the human experience, whether it be in our country or any place else. And you're absolutely right, both of you. The, 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 that higher education will continue to shape the human experience and shape our societies in ways that maybe it hadn't been able to before because we had seen things in right. ways that we had only taught each other. And so, Bev, as we continue to, to, to challenge ourselves, to listen to other perspectives that aren't ours, it actually strengthens our position or it helps us to move to the right places that we know we need to be. So um, VCU is a, a wonderful place to, to do all of this. Um, Ed, I know it was very difficult for you. You were at a loss for words many times this, e this evening, but um, <laughs> thank you so much. But no, truly, you've both been wonderful. It's delightful to have you here. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to learn from both of you tonight. Right. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>